Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to a new episode of the Gratitude Podcast. With me today, I have Julie Santiago. She's a former Wall Street VP. She helps women to become awakened. She's the leader of the Soul Shine Sisterhood and the Facebook group, The Gratitude Circle, that has over 40,000 members. She's the author of the book, Awaken, The Six Secret Steps to Remember Who You Are and Why You're Here. Otherwise, she's a wonderful, loving, grateful human being that I'm really happy to bring on the podcast. And I was really looking forward to interviewing for quite some time right now. And uh, I'm really happy that we got to do this. Julie? Welcome to the Gratitude Podcast. Oh, thank you. I am so happy to be here, Georgian. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm really eager for us to talk about your story, about how the, the book got to become a reality and all of the wonderful things that, that you are doing in the world and also what we can learn and apply in our lives as well. So uh, let us know a, a bit of background on your story. Like, how did you come from uh, Wall Street and to uh, doing this kind of work? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, my story is a, is a, is a bit of a crazy one. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's, you look at the, the trajectory of my life and it doesn't seem to make too much linear sense. Um, I grew up in, in the South, in, in the U.S., but in Louisiana. My family was Southern and Catholic, and um, I remember when I was a kid, my, my dad really, my family really valued education. My dad was the first one in his family to go to college, and he would always say, you're going to go to the best school that you can get into. So at a very early age, um, I became quite an achievement addict. That's kind of what I say. My first addiction was achievement. I was the president of all the organizations and I made the best grades and I wanted to be involved in everything. There was this part of me that really loved achieving. And then I went to a great school in the US, Johns Hopkins University. And when I graduated, I got a job on Wall Street and it all made perfect sense on paper. You, know, you go to a good school, you get a good job, you do that job, you make money, period, the end. And I woke up at you know 20 odd something years old and I was really miserable. I had this perfect on paper life, I was making great money, I was rising up the corporate ladder, everything looked good. But on the inside, I felt like there was um, a tremendous hole that I kept trying to fill with things outside of me, money or food or wine or more work hmm. to numb the discomfort of the fact that I was living so much out of alignment in my life. So fast forward the story. It was my 29th birthday. I was sitting eating lunch with a bunch of girlfriends. And I had this moment, this out of body moment where I looked around the table and I heard every single one of the women talking about their lives. And I thought to myself, wow, Julie, you have nothing to add to this conversation. You have no idea who you are. You've lost your spark. At the time I was struggling with depression and anxiety and an eating disorder and, you know, a drinking, you know, drinking too much at night. And um, on the outside, I looked okay. But on the inside, I felt so lost. And it was in that moment that was like a crack in the fabric of my life. And within that next year, things fell apart and then began to fall back together. But my body fell apart. Um, there was a series of different things. And it was in that year uh, that I found gratitude. And I had heard, if 
you go to bed at night and you write five things you're grateful for, it'll change your life. I was like, that is absurd. <laughs> but I'm going to try it because I'm desperate. And I got myself a, you know, a, little, a little notebook, a little journal. And I remember opening that little journal for the first night, writing the first thing I was grateful for. And it was so simple and so silly because I couldn't think of anything else. I was like, grateful for my family? That was it. Every night for the next handful of months, I would go to bed and write something I was grateful for. I would review my day and find it. And one thing turned into three things, turned into five things, turned into 10 things. And then before I knew it, I was able to fill journal pages filled with the things I was grateful for. And then before I knew it, I, it wasn't just happening at night. When I was reviewing my day, it started happening in the middle of the day. And the life that I was living hadn't changed on the outside at that point. It still looked the same. But the way I interacted with my life was completely different. And that mindset shift, that internal shift, was enough to begin to shift, to begin to shift everything in my life. And then ultimately, I found the courage to leave the job and found myself on this path of becoming um, a, a teacher, you know, a coach, a writer, a speaker which is what my heart wanted all along. But before I could get here, I had to learn to be grateful for where I was. So that's how that developed. And then the book has really just been birthed out of my journey these past seven years. It's everything that I've learned, the, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows. And it's these six sacred steps that I think we walk when we're on the path of remembering who we are, of awakening to who we've always been. So the book is just a compilation of the crazy journey um, that I've been on these past seven years since that day on my 29th birthday, where I had that moment of, of a crack in my life. Hmm. This is so interesting when we, we get in those moments of our lives, when we feel that something needs to change and uh, it matters so much how we, see things and how we change on the inside even more uh, than the things that are going on out on going on on the outside um, but I'm really curious how do you see gratitude now that you've had so much experience with it and so much joy from it and uh, it has been with you for so much time yeah that's a good question It has changed. It has changed. Um, I would say there's two things that come to mind. One is that gratitude just happens now. It's almost as if my life has become a living gratitude list in my head. Do you know what I mean by that? You're shaking your head. Yes. It's, it's fascinating that it just becomes a new thought pattern all this is this is the new story that runs rather than thinking about the negative i can literally look around in any moment and not even realize that i'm giving thanks it's just happening so i will tell you that my life in many ways on a daily basis feels like i was going to say a miracle and I, and i don't mean to sound that to sound trite but it just feels like such a gift And people ask me that all the time. How are you so loving? How are you so happy? And it's not me. It's simply that I've learned to pay attention to how incredible life really is. I just focus on that. So that's the first piece, that it feels so natural, that there's this gratitude tape recorder running in my head most of the time. But then the second thing that I want to say and there's really just to normalize it, <clears throat> is sometimes I'm still prone to negative thinking. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes I get scared and overwhelmed. Um, and so I still have to remember, I, I, I'm here to practice gratitude. Um, and I'll share one more thing about that in a moment, but I just use my tools now. I have tools. 
when I'm stuck in the negativity or I'm, you know, judging my husband for being a certain way or um, freaking out about something in my work or wanting more, right? Because that's the way it shows up for me now is how can I be satisfied, so satisfied with life exactly the way it is right now without needing more, without needing more. And I think that's kind of the, the practice as human beings, right? Like it's a paradox of I'm completely happy with where I am right now and I'm so excited about where I'm going, but I can't be more focused about where I'm going or I'm not grateful for where I am now. So I think that's the dance that I'm in gratitude with gratitude right now of my life is so incredibly amazing and there's all of these incredible things that I can see that I want, right? To, to have, to experience, to do. But I have to be very careful that I'm not more focused on those things than the present moment or it's gone. Exactly. Make, it, that, make, it makes a lot of sense. And there is this balance that we, we can uh, look for to have those amazing things that we know that are about to happen or uh, we would like them to happen and also feeling the joy and the, the gratitude of being here and now and enjoying all of the beautiful things that we have already created in our life. And there's always this, this balance, but it's important uh, to have those things as well because uh, what I've seen in my life is that we have that need to grow and growing makes us happy and is, is something that's very deep, deeply rooted in, in, uh, in our being. We want to grow and uh, what we can do, you were, you were talking about tools, is using tools to help us grow cheerfully, right? Be being grateful and appreciating and being satisfied with where we are and what we have and enjoying more and that's that's okay like it's really okay to enjoy more but mm -hmm. we will enjoy that more much more <laughs> than we would have enjoyed it if we would just be unhappy with where we are and we would just want to be somewhere mm -hmm. else right mm -hmm. oh i love that i love that so much georgia and that point of um it makes us happy to grow as humans. It makes us happy. It does. It makes us happy. Um, and so giving ourselves permission for that feels so important. And I think my experience with the, it makes us happy to grow as humans is before gratitude, <laughs> um, most of the growth wasn't internal growth for me. It wasn't growth around myself, right? Self-development, self-growth, self-improvement, whatever one would call it, spiritual seeking. Um, it was usually about, so that's inner, right? That's inner growth. For me, it used to be about outer growth. So what is that? Like what we, what we reach for on the outside, right? Like I was saying, more money, um, you know, some people, for some people, right, clothes or relationships or reaching for something outside of ourselves. So there's that, there's that tricky piece of like, why is it that I really want something? If I want something because I think when I have it, that's going to be the thing that makes me happy, then we have to check ourselves. We're off base right? No amount of money or car or job or, you know, losing weight or looking a certain way. None of that is the thing, right? So if it's, if it's in an attempt to make you feel a certain way, when I feel that, then that takes us out of our gratitude practice. Because then we've hooked ourselves into needing something in the future to be okay. Whereas the growth that I think we all long for as humans is the growth of the self, spiritual growth, personal growth, knowing that I'm becoming a better version of myself every day. 
and that as I learn and grow, I can then share that learning and growth and love with someone else. That's that's the more I think that we're all seeking, like that level of growth. Ah, oh, so I just love that um, piece very much. I I totally agree, and I think there is a word to this, and th- this word for me is emotional richness. That mm. we can be rich on the inside as well, and many times we actually want that kind of emotional richness to be rich in emotions to to have experiences or things that make us feel in a certain way but we can generate those feelings as well i'm not Mm. saying that it's bad to have those kind of experiences or the the objects that we want but it's much more up to us to generate them than for those exterior circumstances, external circumstances to, to give them, to, for them to give uh, themselves to us somehow. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, and for me, has been, it has been a, 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 an interesting journey to go on the inside and to, to see the emotional richness and the richness that I, I have on the inside. And I think that without that richness uh, there can be all kinds of external rich riches that we we won't be able to appreciate and if we if we can't appreciate them it's like they're not there from from my point of view right yeah yes we can't appreciate them we can't see them they're not there they're right in front of us but it's just that we our eyes are closed to them It's like the quote, when you focus on what you're grateful for, you have more to be grateful for. So it's just, we start to open our eyes to see it. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And um, I believe that it's important for us to, to talk about these things because they are not so obvious as uh, the external things like, When someone has a big shiny car, everyone sees it. But when someone is emotionally rich or if someone is really grateful, that might be seen, uh, but not as it's not as flashy as uh, those kinds of external things are. And uh, the only way to actually explore these things and to be aware of them is is by by sharing them from people like you that are living with gratitude and are a living example of this and are by their by your example an inspiration for for all of us Mm -hmm. thank you jordan it's so interesting that piece about um what we see on the outside It's so, and our our society, our world um, encourages it. You know, I mean, we live in a world where people make money by marketing to us to make us feel horrible about ourselves so that we need to buy things. Exactly. (laughs) So you turn on the news or you don't. You open social media, um, you walk in the grocery store and there's magazines like we, there's this, there's this thought pattern that has been put on our collective consciousness. You need more, right? It's not us. It's as individuals that have created this, right? In many ways, this is just what has been put on us as a culture and it's the mainstream and it's the norm and it's the way most people live right because we look on the outside if we feel like crap about ourselves on the inside which many of us do many of us do insecure or maybe i'm not enough smart enough or pretty enough or good enough or nice enough whatever in some ways we're all judging ourselves all the time on the inside. So until we do that work of like, 
oh, I'm okay. You know, I'm actually okay. And part of, even part of this, this process is, is the work that I've written in Awaken. It's really to remember who you are and, and to do this healing on the inside so that when you look on the outside, you stop feeling like crap about yourself, comparing yourself to other people. Because if we feel like, if we feel bad about ourselves on the outside, we look on the inside, we look on the outside and we think, well, that person looks like they're happy. Hmm, maybe if I get that thing, like we talked about, then I'll be happy. So it, it's this cycle of feeling like crap about ourselves and then feeling like we need something to make us feel better. We get that thing. It doesn't make us feel better. We feel like we need more. And so it's the cycle that in many ways, the media and our culture has put on us that we need to buy more, right? We need more. And that's the Pete. That's the part of gratitude. It's like, can I appreciate who I am and where I am and what my life looks like right now? Can I learn to find love and compassion within me? Can I learn to say everything is enough right now, no matter what, even if nothing changes, here are all the things that are good. And it's powerful warrior work. This isn't easy because most of society is going to tell us to do it a different way. This is why we have to band together. <laughs> this is why this podcast is so important. And it's why the gratitude circle works. And we need to remember what we're all doing here, which has nothing to do with that outer stuff. Exactly. I, I think you you went on, a, on a, such an important um, part of this, the fact that we are actually bombarded with these uh with this advertisement with these things that and also like social media so even if we don't watch the news we see on social media we see the best pictures of our friends of everyone of the the stars and we compare ourselves with them and we usually we are not at our best selves when we are on social media right and this creates a, a really weird pattern in which we feel bad about ourselves. We see others that seem to have it much better than, than us and we feel worse and, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, there is actually uh, something that points to this. Uh, I don't know if you know about uh, the happiness report. There is this uh, world happiness report that's uh, been published every year. Mm. Uh, about the, um, the happiest countries in the world. And uh, they take into consideration education, um, economics, uh, health, um, security, and uh, also the subjective well-being, like how happy do people think they are? Do, mm -hmm. do they see themselves? And... Um, Usually, uh, so this year and usually, uh, the happiest countries in the world are the northern countries from Europe. And mm. uh, like Norway, Finland, Sweden, also this year in, in top three, there was uh, Switzerland as well. Um, and the interesting thing that they have in common, they have a few things, but one of them is the fact that they are happy with less somehow they are they they have really bad weather most uh, especially in the north they have like really short days and long nights and um, the weather is really cold but they learn to be happy and to appreciate what they have and even though they don't have all of the flashy things that you find in the states or in other parts of Europe, they are happier. And mm. I believe that this has a lot to do with, with their attitude and how, how they see their life. Even though I'm sure that the fact that they have a really good um, education system and uh, uh, their salaries are pretty big, that has, has to do with it. But on the other side, what, what was in, interesting about the study 
was the fact that the states uh, were, I think, 19 or 17 or somewhere around there. And um, that despite of having a really good economic uh, development. And uh, so that made a lot of sense that it's not just about the economics. There are yeah. so many other things that make us happy or not as as a whole as a collective and that that for me was very interesting and i think that it it relates very well to what you just said and with the fact that we have the capacity to to appreciate things and to appreciate life and that actually has to do uh, with our happiness and well-being much more than all of the things that are on the outside. Mm. That is so interesting, the happiness report. I'm going to have to look it up. It's so fascinating. And it, it reminds me, um, one of the first times I ever s saw gratitude, and you probably have such a, an amazing perspective on this, living where you live and in a different part of the world for the most part growing up um you know we didn't have money to travel when i was growing up and much and the first time i left the united states um i was in college i was in i was a 20 21 22 and i went to cuba so the first time i ever went to um you know a developing country and I was in school and um, I went with a class and we were studying while we were there and they had organized different things for us to do. And one of those things was we went to this school and we drove on a bus through this, these tiny streets and, you know, in Cuba at the time really hadn't been opened at, at all. It is now to the U.S., but for the most part, it hasn't developed much past the 1950s, which is when the, the U.S. embargo started. So developmentally, most of the cars are still, you know, cars from the 1950s and 60s. And so we're driving through and um, dirt roads and just, you know, utter po poverty in, in, in so many ways. And we pull up to the school and it's this one room and there's dirt floors and, you know, like no windows and we all sit on these tiny little chairs and there's a group of eight year olds who have prepared a performance for us. And the teacher was got them all in a line and, you know, one little girl did some ballet because she was learning how to dance and another little boy counted to 10 in French because he was learning how to speak French. And then the teacher walked over to the, um, the, the cassette player, pressed play, and all of a sudden the song Imagine came on, the song by John Lennon, Imagine, in English. And all of the children started dancing and singing the words to the song in English. They all wow. knew the song. And they stood at the front of the classroom singing to this group of, of American students. And in, and in my mind, right, um, that represents a country that in some ways is, 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 is why they're so impoverished. And um, they were so happy. And they just sang the song. Imagine, you know, there's, there's, there's a world we live as one. And <clears throat> it was in that moment that I was so touched by how simple life can be, how absolutely simple. And of course, through the eyes of children, it is always simple, right? But I saw gratitude in action. Like in that moment, like it didn't matter that these kids didn't have shoes or electricity or sometimes running water, there was still joy. And I had a very similar experience living in South America volunteering for a year and spending time in India in my, in my later life. I saw these different cultures that somehow were able to be happy with less. And it doesn't mean that they're without problems. 
right? And it doesn't mean that there's not there's there's economic security there. They actually are happier with less. And here I am living in a country for the most part that I mean, we can put we totally different conversation about the United States mm -hmm. in general, but for the most part, where we have so much more than 99% of the world, and yet depression and obesity and mental disease and addiction are higher than ever in our country. Why is that? When we have everything in our fingertips, right? So it's the importance of, of gratitude. It's why we're here. It's, it is the solution. It can be the solution to so much, but it's a practice. It's a practice. I totally believe that. And it's so interesting that you actually um, put into words the exact things that uh, got the states to be at the, the, the 18th or 19th place in this top in this ranking yeah. these were the exact things that uh, a researcher um, that was involved in, in the project have mm. has found and i totally believe that um, gratitude is one of those things that can really have a huge impact and also my my own example i hope that it will be impactful for for many because I am living in a developing country. Um, there are many things, for instance, uh, most probably you don't know about this, about Romania. Um, aside from Syria, uh, from Romania, as a percentage, there are the most people living. So wow. the, uh, it's not the best place to be generally, and people are not enjoying it too much and they are emigrating quite a lot. But um, this is exactly why I am doing this from here. And I, that's why I think that it can give perspective on how we can find gratitude, even in those places from which people live, because they really don't enjoy them, you know. And being anywhere else in the world, you can you can feel gratitude just for being there, you know? Yeah. yeah. That brings tears to my eyes, Georgian. <laughs> really, I mean, really. Um, it is so incredible. Um, because that is it, right? Can we, give, can we give thanks even when things are really hard? Even when things aren't the way we want them to be? Um, so I just honor you so deeply for this, for doing this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. But uh, I, I wanted to go uh, into, into a direction that has a lot to do with women. There are a lot of women listening to our interview and listening to the Gratitude podcast. And uh, I think from some points of view, it's even harder for them because for, for us men, uh, there are things that... Um, might influence us to when it comes to happiness and our uh, self-image and things of this nature. But with women, I think uh, the the challenge is is even bigger because there is a bigger industry that has to do with uh, making women feel that they are not beautiful, that they are not worthy, and all kinds of things. So, um, how are you helping women? Uh, with this and I know that through your work and through your book you are doing exactly this yeah yeah it's such an interesting perspective I was actually thinking earlier in our conversation I want to talk about the fact that you're a man and you're doing this work so <laughs> thank you the, the piece of, of of the masculine and the feminine um and the sacred masculine and feminine so thank you for representing that sacred masculine and and what's possible. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, we all see what's happening in the world right now with women in different ways, um, but something is shifting. Um, and women are beginning to find their voices again and take ownership of their lives and really take their power back. 
not from a place of um, taking down the masculine or the patriarchy. I don't, those aren't, that's not language that I use. This isn't a war. We're not taking anyone down. I don't even think we're resisting or fighting. I think we're just rising. I think we're remembering and we're rising. You know, I mean, one of the ways that people are controlled is by being pitted against each other and pitted against themselves. And we've all experienced that, especially women, the way women have been subjugated and made to compete with each other and turn on each other. Um, you know, I mean, up until, um, up until relatively recently, women couldn't be on, couldn't own a house by themselves without having a man, right? Sign with them. Um, women weren't allowed to vote. Weren't, I mean, we all know this, right? Just within the past 100 years. And, um, and women are, I feel the need to say this, women are one of many marginalized groups, but white women, um, how do I want to say this? What's happening right now in, in, in the black community as well and um, in other really um, marginalized um, groups is that we're all finding our voice. So that's the first piece that I want to say. When it comes to women, all women, we've been told that we were the lesser sex for centuries, you know? that you are uh, what you look like. You are, your job is to be wife and to be mother. That was our role until in many ways um, feminism started. And then the way that feminism swung us was in another direction, which is I can be superwoman and now I need to be, I can be a man, right? So we lost so much of the femininity when we learned that we could do everything, right? So then women began to take on everything, the role in the home and the role in, in work. And, and there's this pervasive feeling among the women that I work with that, that um, life is simply unsustainable, that they're all really smart and they function really well. And on the outside, things look okay, but on the inside, they actually don't feel okay. I don't feel okay. Um, so the work is about slowing down. The work is about healing those parts of ourselves that don't feel good enough, that reject the feminine in us, because we do, all of us, we've learned to exist in a masculine society, so we've become men. But our power is actually learning to be women. So it's about learning that the feminine is fierce and she sets boundaries and she's loving too, right? But it's really about redefining what the feminine looks like for all of us. And as we do that, we also redefine what the masculine looks like within us and outside of us. And so I'm struck by our conversation in this moment. It's not about the women, it's about the, it's not about the women taking over. It's about the women healing and finding their power and stepping into it and then asking the men to do the same thing. It's about the union of the masculine and feminine within, within us and then in the world. Because if we lead with hearts open, which is the essence of the feminine, the essence of the feminine is the heart and our emotions and our tenderness, right? And then if we also then lead with the fierce strength of a mama bear, right? Then nothing can stop us as women and we will change the world. But we can't lead with the sword first. We lead with the heart, <laughs> with the chalice. And then when we need the sword, we pick it up, but from a place of love, always from a place of love. And many of us have been told that our tenderness or our open hearts or our emotions are too much. And so we've shut them down. So much of the journey is learning 
to find them again, to access them again, to peel back those layers, to reveal the heart, to reveal that essence of who we are underneath. I, I love it. And I think that you are a perfect example of that. And I, I, was, I was telling uh, Julie before we, um, we actually started recording that what I really appreciate about her that is the fact that she is a new type of leader. Uh, she leads with love and, like she said, with boundaries. And she, I've heard her speak in the group and I, I, I've seen how much power that can, can yield. And uh, the fact that she loves the people that are in the group so much and she's so strong in that energy and uh, in that le leadership stance and setting boundaries and being protective of the group is something new that I, I haven't seen until I, I've, I've seen her. And for me, for instance, uh, leadership meant, like I saw my father. My father is, is pretty masculine. He is like, uh, when he was in the army, he was something like, uh, everyone was fearing me. And yeah. he was very proud of that. And yeah. I somehow didn't resonate with that. I, I, I said, okay, I want to be a different kind of leader. I want people to respect me but not because they fear me and to, to follow me because they, they feel it's the right thing and they appreciate who I am rather than making them feel afraid that if they don't, they will get punished some one way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand that it was his journey and it, it made him feel like it, he was in his own power but it is, didn't resonate with me. And it's interesting that now I see another kind of leader and another kind of leadership. And I've also seen something uh, similar. I'm not aware of the whole story about this, but it reminded what you just said. It reminded me of that. Um, the president of Costa Rica, I've mm -hmm. seen a, a short movie on Facebook. I might not know everything, but that bit was very touching she was um she was so the the four years or i don't know exactly how many years they they have there um as being president uh was were over and uh, there were there were a lot of people that came to thank her and mm -hmm. she was so touched she she uh she was crying and it was very beautiful for me to see that she was strong, she was touched. So I, I felt that she could handle things and she could do things. And even though she was touched, even, even though she was crying, it, it was dignity and uh, leadership and strength and emotions as well. And I really loved that. And I think that we need that in the world like we even as as uh, humans as kids we need that from from our feminine counterparts from our mothers our uh, grandmothers and also in general in leadership it, it's it's a different kind of leading people and i think it's really inspiring yeah yeah Mm, that was such a that's beautiful thank you thank you for yeah. sharing my yeah. pleasure my pleasure so tell us a little bit more about your book and what you're what you're doing with it and where you're taking the women reading it yeah well i like that you said where i take the women because it does it feels like a journey the book really feels like a journey and You've experienced that in the gratitude circle when we do the 40 days. It's a journey we go on. Um, so we go on a journey. And, you know, the first few chapters are really about my story and what got me here and vulnerability, very vulnerable. And, um, and then I talk a lot about, um, you know, kind of what happened and what got me here and how this, this framework, this, these six sacred steps of awaken kind of developed 
And then I take the women through or the reader through each of the six sacred steps. So I pull from my own experience and I've taken um, many, many women through this process, so through their experiences as well. And each sacred step, um, at the end of each chapter, there's sacred work. So I'm very big on experiential exercises. I don't want to talk to you. I want you to experience something, right? So there's sacred, there's a sacred practice, something you can apply in your life for that sacred step and then questions, right? Inquiries for you to journal on and then, um, sacred words and affirmation for each chapter and then there's a playlist a music playlist for the whole book and it's a sacred sound so each of these six chapters these six sacred steps build on each other these six steps of awakening the first is awareness the second is acceptance the third is acknowledgement the fourth is appreciation the fifth is action and the sixth is allowing. So we go on this journey of like, where are you in your life that you may feel stuck, out of alignment? How do you identify with that? How do you have the courage to change it? Not numb out about it, not take action to fix it, accept it, begin to dream, deal with the fears that come up, learn to appreciate that all life has been happening for you. Put your eyes on where you wanna go, take inspired baby steps and then learn to trust life. That's the journey, it's this journey um, that we go on again and again. So um, that's the book, that's the journey. And you know, there's lots of tools and it's meant to be interactive and experiential. And I'm just so excited to share it with people in this way. I, I can imagine because I know that the journey of actually bringing this book into this world wasn't an easy one for you or let's say it, it was more complicated than uh, you usually thought it would be can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that oh totally so i started writing the book about a year and a half ago and in my mind i was gonna write this book you know fast <laughs> um which is the masculine in me, right? It's just like one day, get it done. But like all things in life, um, <laughs> my plan is not the only plan um, that's on the table. So yeah, so I started the book. I got pregnant within a few weeks of starting the book, a little unexpectedly, but you know, it was a welcome surprise for my husband and I. And um, it felt like you know this little spirit baby had come in to really help me with the book and writing. And, and then I finished the book couple of months later and then shortly after that I had a miscarriage and then what I found out when I was at the doctor was the timing of the miscarriage was actually um, that the, the, the little embryo stopped growing the day I finished the book which is such a fascinating um, thing right um, and I write about this kind of in the introduction of the book and why that journey had to happen I put the book on pause. I had to, I had to mourn. I had to feel my feelings. And, um, and, um, and then months later, you know, really over nine months later, um, I picked it up again and then the book became a completely different book, right. With more stories and more richness and, um, and then trusting the timing of that, you know, like, okay, great, it's gonna be done in January, you know, February, you know, March. And, you know, I think we all have these ideas of like what we want life to look like, but the truth is, is this is why the last sacred step is allowing, because we can't control. We take action, which is the fifth sacred step, and then we let go. And we trust that life is doing for us what we can't always do for ourselves. And we trust that there's this universal intelligence sometimes that's running through us. And one of the things that I also share in the book is, you know, um, my due date was um, the same month that a, a historical wildfire blew through my town. Luckily, our home made it, but the community was destroyed, and we were um, we were evacuated from our home for you know almost a month. Wow. I would have been giving birth at that time, so I couldn't see how things connected until 
I saw how they connected and how life was really taking care of me. And so it's just this interesting piece of trusting that life doesn't always make sense. And sometimes things really hurt and really suck, but there's always a reason for them. Like it's never happening to us, right? It's always happening for us in some way. We don't always understand it when it happens, but we will if we keep our eyes open. So, so much of that lesson is really woven into, into the book. Um, so I do feel like this book birthed me um, and I'm just so excited to give it to the world um, because it really has made me um, a different woman. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. And um, you mentioned something about trust and I couldn't help but relate it to what brother David Steindl Rust said uh, in our interview. Mm-hmm. He said that um, one of the most important things that gratitude gives us is this trust and he is over 90 years old and uh, the fact that he can say this from his perspective having lived a lot of his life is very important for all of us to hear and to, to actually understand that it's such an important part and allowing of course is is what makes things work and not uh, opposing them and allowing them to to flow how how it's best that they do and uh, i think it's it's a beautiful conne- connection and it's quite amazing how creations in general um they they need some particular time and we need to grow to a particular level to to do that for instance, I uh, I really don't feel that I'm there to write a book. I still feel that I, I have a lot to, to learn and to grow. Um, but when the, that moment is right, you, you just know. And uh, I, I think this is very important for us to listen to that inner guidance, inner voice that, that's helping us, right? Yeah. Yes, I love that. Gratitude gives us trust in life. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah, I love it too. So where can we find your book? Where can we find your work? Yes. So my my website will have everything. It's my name, juliesantiago.com. And you can go straight to find the book and get the book. And there's some free gifts when you when you get it um, at juliesantiago.com forward slash book. So very easy, but you can find everything there. And I have, you know, free meditations and lots of other goodies. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us, for being so present and for sharing all of these amazing, emotionally rich moments that, Mm -hmm. uh, I hope will inspire many people. Thank you, Georgian, for doing this work and for inviting me here. I'm so, so grateful to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm-hmm.